Welcome to this fireside chat uh, at the Zero Project Conference 2022. And I'm uh, glad and happy to have uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, of the person that I admire most in this world of philanthropy and, uh, and uh, impact investing and scaling uh, here with me um, uh, today. And actually, I think we also some are like friends. So uh, welcome, uh, Madeleine, uh, to join us here uh, at this fireside talk. Welcome, Madeleine Clark. Yeah, so we got some technical glitches, but uh, I'm looking at the screen and I think it will be over in a, in a few seconds. So then let me give you a brief introduction uh, without uh, Madeline, and she will join us soon. So Madeline Clark is um, a person, she, um, ah, here she is. Um, welcome, Madeline. So um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you yeah, perfectly. So you, didn't, you didn't miss a thing. I just introduced you as a as one of the of the of the great ladies of venture philanthropy and of impact investing, of scaling, and also as a long-term uh, colleague and and even a friend uh, that have done a lot of things together already. So welcome, Adeline, and uh, I suggest you you start uh, this uh, fireside talk uh, with introducing yourself. Sure. So as Michael says, Madeline Clark, and uh, yeah, Michael and I know each other uh, through. Um, our contact in EVPA, but even before that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a psychologist by profession, uh, have been a rights ad advocate, have been working in management in non-governmental organizations, independently consulting then with a lot of statutory organizations. Uh, and um, uh, I put together an organization called Genio in 2008, and we are very focused on scaling innovation, social innovations to tackle complex, uh, complex problems. So um, yeah, we're in the, the, the hard space of scaling and systems change, but enjoying it. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of people nowadays talk about scaling and about uh, innovations and uh, letting them grow and uh, letting them change the system. But uh, you've definitely developed one of the strongest model that at least I know of. Uh, so the Cheney model is not some ideas about scaling. So this is happening and this is really happening big scaled compared to other countries and other environments. So maybe give us a, a background also of where that came from, uh, what kind of money you're, uh, you got and uh, wh where you currently are with Genio. Sure. So we began um, many years ago by looking for innovations that uh, were really helping people, particularly at that time in the disability area, which we're currently in still and the mental health area. Since then, we have added in many more areas, uh, migrants, um, uh, older people with dementia, uh, people tackling drug and alcohol uh, conditions, travelers who are more nomadic uh, migrant community, um, but indigenous community in Ireland, um, and also homelessness. Uh, so we, um, it was interesting, we began by looking at innovations that were very much centered on helping people from the point of view of the person themselves. So really very person-centered work, putting putting the end beneficiary right in the center. And then we realized having both um, funded and provided non-financial support uh, to many innovations that some of this work was absolutely fantastic and really needed to be scaling and was very aligned with public policy. So our way of working has been to combine public funding with private funding, philanthropy in our case, um, although more recently we're looking at the area of social investment. Um, but yeah, we are now at a stage where we have scaled, I suppose, to national level, three different evidence-based innovations. We've been managing a fund of 45 million, which is 30 million state funding and 15 million philanthropy. And that is uh, very dedicated to trying to bring innovations that have been proven to be successful in really uh, you know, changing people's lives in a sustainable way um, to bring those to scale to national level. Yeah, so um, from what I know, it's this model uh, of Genio is quite unique. Uh, could you give us a little more detail on how you're selecting the project and how you're approaching this and what your role is uh, beside deciding who gets the money? I trust you're also involved in the projects and uh, try to learn and, uh, and what kind of, yeah, I don't know if you use theory of change, but what kind of impact measure or, or a steering model you're using? 
Okay, so um, yeah, so like the basic theory of change is uh, it acknowledges that you know for big societal challenges um, you must involve the public sector because the public sector has both both the money and they have the mandate they have the electoral mandate to pursue national policy objectives so it's very important uh, to do things with those big systems if you want big change otherwise you are struggling on the margins with projects and trying to find new resource all the time to replicate. So what we're about really is using uh, philanthropic funding as a catalyst to help refocus larger public budgets. And the basic methodology is to uh, um, work closely in developing a fund together and then in developing criteria against which we will release that funding. Uh, and then alongside the funding, we build capacity for change because as all of you know, um, well, I suppose it's true that most of us think that we are doing great things and that we're doing the right thing and human beings are like this. So if change comes, it can be very threatening uh, and not very welcome sometimes. So we need to work right inside the systems to help people uh, who know that there's maybe a better way to go, but of course, particularly in those public systems, all of the funding is already being spent. So those large organizations have, if you like, no R&D budget. They have an operational budget generally, and they have very little funding to spend on innovation or on the kind of cost that it takes to change from one approach to another. So if all your money is being spent in one direction and you want to try something very different, so if you want to close institutions for people with disabilities and help them live in the community, then you need some bridging finance. You need some funding that will develop those supports in the community while the resources are being withdrawn from an older model that's less helpful. And that kind of bridging finance is very, very important because it helps transfer eventually the larger funding and refocus it in a more cost effective direction in the interests of, of the person who really needs the support. So that model has been, we've been developing that model over 10 years and more recently now have brought it into the European context where we've managed the European funding, funding with um, some commission funding and foundation funding to again identify innovations that could be scaled within member states or indeed across member states. Mm -hmm. One other aspect of the methodology which has become quite integral now is the idea of resourcing people to plan. So we don't expect that if people have a terrific innovation that it will just eventually be adopted by everybody. People are not generally waiting for these new ideas in these big systems. They know there are new ideas out there. Their challenges in implementation is in refocusing those, that spending. So helping them to develop plans about how they will do that and how they will do that with external stakeholders as well has been really good in helping us spend larger amounts of money more cost effectively. Um, thanks, Madeleine. Uh, I suggest we drill down a little on this uh, on this experience of yours in 10 years, what actually works. Uh, and uh, you mentioned already two, uh, two points that I think are interesting, maybe even critically interesting. So one is you mentioned this bridging financing. In my words, it would mean so to change a system at for some period of time, you have to finance both the old system parallel to the new system. So these people that have vested interests that uh, need time to transfer, that are anxious that they're losing something, uh, so there is a time to adjust and to the to the new system. Is this something in, in the way that it really works, what I, I just said? Yes, that's it exactly, Michael. Um, you can imagine, so, you know, if that example of an institution is a very good one. So it costs a lot to run an institution. Heating, lighting, staff, central kitchens, all that goes with those large buildings. Um, and their maintenance. And in moving people out to, to a better life um, and helping them connect into the community, you still have all those running costs. In fact, you can't really shut that building down until the last person leaves and turns out the light, if you like. So you need this additional and parallel funding is a good way to describe it so that you're building supports in the community. Or for example, we work in the homeless area. So we're particularly focused on, on helping people get off the streets, the, the, the rough sleepers who are accessing emergency accommodation or indeed often choosing not to access the emergency accommodation as places that can be quite dangerous for them. Um, and trying to help the government refocus investment 
in in homes for people because after all where people are homeless it's what they need is a home they're less a home and that's what they need so the the initiative housing first that some of your listeners may be aware of is really about finding some accommodation and involving the person in as far as possible to, in choosing that home and without any conditions without saying you must comply with this um, drug treatment program or you must comply with this therapy or you must do this that or the other you give the person the home and then you work out with that person what their goals are and what will help them maintain that tenancy and what will help them re-enter life uh, perhaps the workforce perhaps a social life that is not back on the streets um, and that that is something that uh, is working really well it's a well evidence-based uh, um, approach but again the emergency accommodation is still required those big hostels and shelters are required until you can travel over to that new model completely so that parallel funding is very important and it's in sharp contrast with um, foundations who who often uh, find very good best-in-class projects to invest in and then perhaps even more helpfully we'll give them some funding for evaluation but then find how how will they how will this good work be sustained and scaled beyond the investment of the um of the grant from the foundation mm -hmm. this is much more about building a strategic alliance between partners at the very beginning and rather than finding the best in class programs and hoping that they will spread to everybody it's a much more complex approach which recognizes that within any country for any population in need there are varied quality there's very quality there are some great pockets of brilliant work and then there's some very poor work and um, and then from the end beneficiaries point of view if they are not the paying customer they are at the mercy of whatever happens in their local air catchment area so this is about a strategy for systems change that recognizes that and builds out from success and helps people in an incremental way at the beginning to really adopt good practice, get very excited about it. And then of course the staff themselves sell this. So sometimes we've been making, you know, videos of staff talking about new ways of working that of course is, you know, much more fulfilling because they're reaching objectives and they're doing what they entered into these professions to do in the first mm -hmm. place. Uh, Madeline, we are almost uh, close. I'm getting just a sign, it's just two minutes, but I got one more uh, question and it's uh, unfortunately already the closing question in every organization uh, that has to change or that needs to change there are some people who are hardcore against this change w what 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 is your, what is your way what is your experience how to work with these people are you engaging with them in a stakeholder dialogue or are they simply have to be pushed out or uh, w w yeah. could you give us an idea how to work with those yeah. people that are heavily opposed to any kind of change in, in a minute? I know okay. this takes an hour, but uh, what, what would you advise in a minute? I can give you three things in a minute. First of all, uh, most people uh, are resisting change for reasons that make complete sense to them. So it's important not to be blaming, but to understand um, so that you can develop a strategy that combats that. Um, but uh, always you will have people who will resist change, even are not confident in embracing change. The first thing is to harness the voice of the people for whom the innovation, for whom the change matters most. That voice out trumps everybody else's, everybody else's, trades union officials, everybody else's. Nobody will face down the person who's saying this service is for me and this is not what I want or I want this change. Secondly, I think hearing from their colleagues, so starting and building a coalition of the willing, if you like, people who are dissatisfied, who want to do something and let them talk to their own peers. That's often quite persuasive. If none of that works, Michael, what we have been involved in doing is helping organisations bring in a change man management team and bypass those who won't change. Just put in a new team. And that's a very good use sometimes of additional funding to do that for a period and have this change working and then these people either get completely left behind or they eventually join in however reluctantly mm -hmm. thank you Madeline. um it was uh, great as over talking to you in uh, in in those 15 minutes i think next time we tackle a, a subject like scaling we should not have an, a 15 minutes discussion but write the book together uh, so i think that we could go on and on about this there's so much to say and so much to learn from each other Thank you, Madeline. It was a great uh, talk to you as always, uh, and this completes uh, this fireside uh, chat. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'm glad it was helpful. Bye, Michael.